to welcome everybody here. Thanks, Tom, for the quick introduction. Uh, I'm an executive residence at the Kogod School of Business, and I'm co-director of our business incubator, uh, student uh, venture uh, incubator that we just started uh, last spring, uh, unofficially launched it officially this last September, so we're real excited about it and really given a chance to get the students out of their dorm rooms, out of their apartments to come and give them a place to uh, actually develop their ideas. Uh, but I, the reason we're here tonight is not because of me, but it's because of this wonderful, uh, extraordinary panel of entrepreneurs who are here this evening with us. Uh, what I'd like to do is just quickly, um, I'll just say their name, a couple of short points about them, and then I'm going to launch into some questions for them. Um, and then uh, we have a hard stop time, which I'll uh, keep to myself for right now, uh, so that we can have a chance to change over and move to the, to the main event for this evening. So a couple of guidelines for our panelists tonight. Uh, let's keep the answers tight and short so we can get in as many questions as we can. All right, so first I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Tian Wong, who's sitting over here on the end here, CEO of Tech 2000, Chairman of APNEC, uh, chairman of Lore Systems and uh, uh, Opus 8. He's also the founder of the Big I C Idea Connect Preneur Forum. Um, sitting next to him is Paula Jagman Bain, who's CEO and founder of Someone with Group and founder of Online Office Supplies. And next to her is uh, Melinda Whitstock, who is the CEO and founder of Verifeed, Newsit, and Capital News Connection. And right here to my immediate left is uh, Jason Gantz, who's CEO and co-founder co of Agora. Vir, uh, VR, virtual reality, and he is a recent COGOD a graduate. So we're excited to have them here. Okay, um, first question, and this one is to everybody, okay, to everyone. As entrepreneurs, you are taught to always be ready for your 30 second pitch, your one minute pitch, and your three minute pitches. I'd like for every one of each of you to give us your best one minute pitch, starting wherever you want to. Is this, can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. So if only you knew the scale of an untapped market, the 10 people who will be your next million customers, or you could predict trends ahead of anybody else. My company, Verifeed, is a strategic social intelligence company, and that's what we do. We increase people's revenue, we help them find their customers, we predict trends. It all translates into their bottom line, which is why our revenue is growing 40% month on month. Thank you. Great. Okay. I guess us girls are going to go first. <laughs> Ladies first. Hi, I'm Paula Jagman. I am fortunate enough to have been a serial entrepreneur in this area for a number of years. I was part of the executive team that took UUNet public. I was there for pre and post IPO. Sold that stock in uh, 1999, get the years right. WorldCom <laughs> fraud started in 2000, but luckily I was able to leave. And I did start a company called Online Office Supplies, which we immediately sold, retained the software, raised 92 million of venture capital, and built out one of the largest supply chain networks and office products, Jansan, in the very exciting world of janitorial supplies. That company was sold last March to Carlisle Group for $420 million. I came out of retirement for this company. It's a medical company that helps people crowdfund for their medical journey, their unwanted medical journey. We have two patents pending. It's kind of crowdfunding with teeth. Hope you'll hear more in a minute. Okay. Um, I've been a serial entrepreneur since I was born and um, had a company here in the DC region which I sold to a public company and then became an angel investor and then after that acquired two technology businesses. So. Tech 2000 is a company that serves Fortune 100 companies like Apple, Cisco, MetLife, and others. And what we do is we develop education technology solutions for them. So we do learning analytics, and uh, we do mobile application, mobile education development for them. And uh, as a result, we've sort of, I like to call it a idea factory because we've patented and developed a lot of technology that we're spinning off. Appnetic is an example of one of the technologies that we're spinning off. And, what that is, that allows you to build a mobile app, a native mobile app, um, very quickly, load it with whatever content you want, and distribute it to as many users as you want. So Cisco has 8,000 uh, channel field sales reps using our product with 1,500 pieces of collateral in it. So um, that's what we're doing. Great. Good. Thank you. Over the past several years, content marketing and webinars in particular have become one of the key tools in every marketer's toolbox. 
But with the explosion of content across the web, it's becoming harder than ever to attract, engage, and retain users. Luckily, there's a technology coming along that is so powerful that we can harness it to do just that. At Agora VR, we're building the world's first platform for virtual reality webinars, events, and presentations. By harnessing this incredible social technology, we're able to drive leads and increase conversions like never before. Okay, good. Thank you all very much. Okay, second question here. Entrepreneurs are always asked about what problem are you trying to solve? They're also often asked, what are you passionate about? The question for the panelists, do you believe you need to, be, to have both to be successful as an entrepreneur? Or can you just be really pissed off about something and want to go out and fix it? I think it's important to have passion. It's, you can succeed without it. A lot of people have. But passion is sort of the fuel that gets you up every morning. It sustains you during, you know, not just the ups, but really during the down periods. And, it's sort of the energy that you draw from that allows you to keep getting up and getting beaten up every day. So I do think passion is critical, but not necessary. I agree. It's, it's hard to recreate passion. I know everybody thinks you can. You really can't. Passion comes from within. It comes from the cause or the mission to the problem you're trying to fix. We're fortunate because we're in the healthcare space. We're helping individuals avoid bankruptcy by crowdfunding for their medical journey and their medical expenses in a way that's never been done. So it's the passion of not only are we created a new technology, but the implications, the social impact implications of what we have brought to market is that's what gets you up every single day. I, I agree. I mean, I think the passion can be linked to wanting to solve a problem or something that frustrated you um, or you a gap in the market or whatever, or something that's just intensely personal. But, you know, this is such a roller coaster ride that in any given day, you know, you're on an up or a down. You have things that are that you can't necessarily control um, that are beyond your control or you have fail moments. You have all those things. And so it's hard, you know. So if you have a passion, you know where you're going. Um, if you think of, I don't know how many of you sail, for instance, but you're, you're sailing in a direction you cannot go, it's impossible to go in a straight line. You have to tack and the wind changes. You're always doing that. And so, but to have that North Star, which to me is the passion, then at least you stand a chance of, of getting where you're going. I know that we are all incredibly passionate about what we're doing at Agora and that's been immensely helpful for us so far. Already, and we're different than, from the rest of these people, obviously, because we're much earlier on our journey. But if we didn't have the passion, I don't even think we would have been able to make it this far. So I think it would be incredibly difficult to do complete, uh, have a complete journey with a company without really being passionate about what you're building. Yeah, Red Bull only gets you so far. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, again, a question for all of you guys. If you were starting a company today, all right, starting a new company today, what would be the first three people you'd want to bring on and why? Okay, it depends on the type of company. Right? That's too easy. First That's too of all, easy. Right? Yeah. Like, no, but it, it really does. Because if you're, if you're doing something that, that is really a B2B, um, that involves an educative sale, you have to have people who are really intuitive and excellent about a consultative, educative sale, right? If you're doing a B2C, big, cusp, you know, big, traction play you know that's a different thing but you know having a technical co-founder and the right technical co-founder is is critical um, and having a CEO or someone on the team or the senior team if it's a team of three who knows how to sell you know whatever it is you're selling whether it's selling or just finding the product market fit and being able to listen th those those roles are critical when it comes time to fundraise um, and this is this has always been an issue it's it's either you're running your company and building the revenue or building the traction or you're out fundraising. And it, 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 it shouldn't have to be an or, but often it is because the fundraising takes so much time. It can be a real distraction and you, you're not, you know, um, you know, uh, raising, you know, you're not able to grow the business to where the investors even want to see you get. Um, so if you're the CEO that's out and the founder that's out doing the fundraising, you better have someone that's really good at the sales piece or at least the product market fit or understanding your customer while you're out doing that. I think um, first you look at your own deficiencies and, and it takes some time, but 
I actually know what my deficiencies are, and it takes a long time to actually get there. You have to ask really hard questions in the mirror and wait for the mirror to give you a really crappy answer back. So I suck at finance, okay? As my, I've got some of my team right here. CFO, absolutely. From Even if you have a passion, if you have a background in finance and accounting, the nuances, the changes, and the advantages you should be taking care of with having an expert at your side, absolutely. In fact, we have an interim CFO who we're, we're replacing right now with Evergreen Advisors out in Columbia, Maryland. They're excellent. So for me, it would be the CFO, which I think is a critical role for anyone. We, did, um, we had some patent and patent protection. So seeking out some advisors who have those skill sets in specific in IP and trying to kind of, you know, pro bono and bootstrap your way with as many favors as you can daisy chain together, that's actually how you get it done. So finance, legal, and then potentially that, that salesperson who could be the advocate in their space. In our space, it's healthcare that can carry that banner into the C-suites. Because without that access, you're a great company with a great idea but no feet to carry it to the door. I'd pick Elon Musk and let him pick the other two. <laughs> 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 but seriously, I mean, I think everyone else has got it nailed. You gotta have people that cover the key skill sets, and for me, that would also be technical and finance are two areas where I could really use some help, so I, I would pick people who are experts in those in whatever domain we're working in. Yeah. Okay. Same. I would just find someone who would complement my deficiencies. Okay. Good. Okay. As uh, as entrepreneurs, what has been your highest high? And then, of course, I'll ask your lowest low later on too. But what's your highest high that you've experienced? I'll start with the lowest low. <laughs> okay. Which what's would your be, lowest lows first? Which would we'll be our there. stint back at WorldCom uh, we, when we tried to write a ship that couldn't turn around. So that was a very difficult time. It's, it's not until you see your name, like Jagman, it's not a common name, in a death and bomb threat letter to you for trying to go back to save a company that you absolutely love. So doing the right thing in a difficult market, was it was incredibly stressful, but on the flip side, I have seen the bankruptcy process, the fraud process, the unethical lives crumble of others. And John Sigmore, my mentor, a phenomenal businessman, you rise above. So that was, we saw the worst of people that we respected. And to me, that will always be the worst. The best, it's, this is a tough one. UUNet went public May 25th, 1995, which is in a month. So that's the 20 year anniversary of the IPO. That one's a pretty good one. Um, and then last would be, I was privileged enough to win Microsoft Solution of the Year and was interviewed by Bill Gates on worldwide live television. And that was pretty special. That's awesome. Wow, my goodness. Okay, so let's I don't know how to top that. Um, so worst moment was probably coming close to running out of cash, like, you know, being in a fetal position, <laughs> like literally in a fetal position with a lot of, you know, because you have a lot of responsibility, you have your team, basically what happened to, to us at a terrible moment, it, just coming up to Thanksgiving when all of corporate America shuts down, a quarter of a million dollar deal that we were absolutely depending on just fell through. There was a weird thing, like the management team got fired. Like it's nothing that we could control. We didn't really do anything wrong. I mean, the, the problem was our pipeline wasn't developed enough and deep enough to sustain us um, through, we made it, like God knows somehow made it. But that, that was pretty bleak and, and just keeping the team together in a situation like that, you know, that, that, that actually speaks to the team, that people, the passion, because <laughs> getting through those kind of moments, but it happens. Um, high points are great, you know, like just like first revenue or hitting milestones, I mean for me, um, it, um, when Verifeed really turned revenue and we started hitting our stride in terms of a repeatable sales process and we started to really see, I don't know, there's lots of great moments. Uh, with News It, Marissa Mayer from Yahoo calling us the future of news, that was kind of fun. You know, winning big awards, um, uh, Capital News Connection beating, uh, was a news organization that I ran, beating CNN's Katrina coverage for the National Public Policy Journalism Award of the Year and doing so on a shoestring budget. I mean, there's a bunch, you know, but yeah. Yeah, we had the same problem. We came within two days of missing payroll and um, that's low and I've lost my largest customer twice. <laughs> and uh, that almost sunk the ship twice. And um, like you said, w you know, when the going gets tough, you know, the loyal team steps up and um, they take pay cuts and take equity in return for pay cuts. And 
you know, your banks step up and, and bail, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for uh, Bank of America who stepped up after we lost our biggest customer. And, um, you know, they gave us a credit line that allowed us to, to stay in business basically for a few months. And, uh, and then we were able to fill the capacity, but those were some tough times. Um, and then high times, I would say, you know, what I, I love most is watching the people that I hired when they were in their early 20s just grow and succeed and um, seeing my teammates um, who, who helped us get to a certain level just go even beyond. For example, after we sold our company, I was about 80 million when we sold. Um, company's over 2 billion now. Uh, my chief operating officer wound up staying on at Xerox or ACS, which was the company that bought us. and wound up leaving to go run a public company. And one of my junior guys who I hired, you know, out of the Naval Academy, basically, he was running about a billion dollars worth of business and just far surpassed anything that I could have done personally or anything that he could have done under our company. So just watching these guys, and, and I can go on and on. I, I got, you know, a dozen to 15 guys that I'm extremely proud of um, in the 10 years since I sold, 12 years since I sold the company, just seeing them just blossom and, and become real amazing not just people, but not just business people, but people too. So that's that's a high to see these guys Absolutely. just succeed. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, a couple months ago, we had our first serious client pitch where if it went well, we would be moving on to go pitch the CEO of a pretty large company to use Agora in their marketing efforts. And of course, the night before, we get make sure all of our technical stuff is working, everything's working well, and then we get to the incubator to get ready to do our pitch. And at 2.30, our product breaks, and we fix it. And then at 4 o'clock, our product ba breaks again. <laughs> and so we had an hour to decide, do we call the meeting off because nothing was working, or do we see if we can fix it? So my co-founder, Matthias, runs and gets another computer and goes and gets back, and we get the product working a minute before our potential client walks in. And then at the end of the meeting, he turns to us and he's like, gentlemen, that was awesome. We're going to New York to pitch this. And uh, that, was, that was a pretty cool moment. Um, you know, one of the transformational things that happens and takes place in a company when you move from, you know, idea, strategy point into real execution. What, what is that like for a company at, at the early stages when you move from that, that thought process and, hey, we've got a really good idea here, we've got some strategies going to now, we're really turning into a, a real business. You know, what does that mean for the staff, for you as a leader, and, uh, and, and how, does that, how does that work? Because that's a pretty big trigger point for everybody. It depends on how quickly it takes place. It feels sometimes like, you know, have you ever seen a Labrador puppy, you know, and their skin is too big for them, their paws, and they're sort of tripping over themselves. It kind of feels a bit like that because you know all the things that you're supposed to be doing, but sometimes the timing doesn't quite align or your, your demand is more than what you can actually deliver on. And you're just trying to get, get all the pieces to, to fit. And and at the same time, you know, you need to, it's a scaling issue, really. Like, you, you need to kind of hit that demand, so you need to to you know, hire more people, but you don't have time to hire them. You don't quite necessarily have enough money yet, depending on how you're growing your company. Um, in our case, you know, we, you know, are mostly bootstrapped, and so you know, in that case, you're growing on revenue alone. So it's tense. If you have the cushion of like your nice big A round, I, I imagine I can only imagine that that must be a little easier. <laughs> <laughs> It's chaos. I mean, it's, 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 it's uh, you know, it's hard. It's great to win business, but then you got to, you know, now you got to deliver. So um, especially when, we're, when, we're, when you're very small, it's really tough because a, a new piece of business is significant. And then when you're small and kind of becoming middle-sized, you know, it's less important, but it's always important to deliver. And it's all of the challenges you can imagine, finding the right people, training the people, retaining them, making sure your customer's happy, pivoting, listening to your customer, feedback. It's just, uh, it's nonstop. So it is chaos. So the, the way I look at it is try to manage the chaos as best as we can and um, give it our best. And at the end of the day, hopefully things will be okay. I kind of have a weird, I, I can always see the end. Like I could see the product, the, the crowdfunding platform. I saw it three and a half years ago. 
And it was a difficult path because we had to be banking and Patriot Information Act compliant and anti-money laundering compliant. We sell the hospital systems. We're HIPAA compliant. We are just compliant all over the place. <laughs> so as you build the product and you see it, I never saw any demo. I never saw any iterative Ooh. versions of the software. I really wanted to see how close it hit the mark. And we are now live at our first hospital up in Pinnacle. It's Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I think to see that product, one of our very first customers, and certainly we know we're going to crowdfund for catastrophic or chronic diseases, and our customers will die. Our very first customer died. And Jill Kerr, who went up and trained the, trained the nurses and the discharge nurses up at Harrisburg, said, you know what, Paula? If we know, never sell another thing, we have done right by that woman. That's why you do it. So we're definitely still in the process of working this out, so thank you all for the advice. <laughs> Uh, but for us, it started getting real when we stopped necessarily putting fr product features in because we thought they would be cool, but more because we had specific deliverables to meet for people that were also passionate about using the company for their own processes, and we started building Agora for other people, not just for ourselves. All right, uh, last question for me, and then we'll open up to the floor here. So if, with all the wisdom at this, on this floor right here, if you could give one piece of advice to our budding entrepreneurs in here, and we've got a lot of them, a lot of students out here tonight, you know, what would that one piece of advice be? Listen to your customer and do everything you can, everything you can to make them happy. I would say do what you're doing now. Get into incubators and other business environments. Networking events are fine, but real tutorial, a curriculum that gets you into an incubator. I founded our incubator in Maryland and was part of TEDCO, which is the state's incubator funding system. And you take advantage of those. Take advantage of programs like these. It's not just the, you know, the structured advice you're going to get along the way. It's the, it's the relationships that I know somebody at PayPal. Let me see if I can make you that introduction. So take as much of the advice as you can and immediately shelve the things that don't gel. If you have to explain it too many times, it's probably not the right advice. So take the advice, filter it, but make sure that you're agile enough to change, but you're, you're true to yourself in, in the process. And that's pretty hard to do. Yeah, I, I'm just going to echo something that uh, Jen said that is really, really important about knowing your customer. And to be able to really know your customer, you also kind of need to be, it's, it's going to sound philosophical, but you need to kind of know yourself. You, you need to be the type of person who's very, very curious who actually can understand what their customer needs and not have your own vision and be true to your own vision but not to the point where you're rigid, that you can't hear what your customers are actually saying to you. So it's kind of a combination of both your advice. It's absolutely critical. Also, just knowing why you're doing it. Like, why are you doing it? Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? If you're doing it for the money, that's not a good reason. <laughs> you can get rich doing other things much faster. If you're doing it because you don't want a, a boss, that's not a good reason because you have a zillion bosses. You know, you really do, and again, need to know yourself and, and the why. Um, and uh, really be able to listen to advice and be flexible about hearing, but at the same time remain true to yourself. And that tightrope, that is easier said than actually done. I, I've seen a lot of people get over-advised and self-conscious and lo you know, lose the plot. So, and, and, uh, so yeah, um, that's what I would suggest. Okay, good. Pay attention to the trends. The world we live in right now is an extremely interesting place that's changing a lot quicker than it ever has before whether it's demographic trends or particularly technological trends, make sure that the company that you're building is gonna be something that makes sense in the world of five years or 10 years. And specifically, if you can build something that that world needs that doesn't exist now, then you're in a great position. Okay, good, thank you all very much. Okay, got in our time remaining here a little bit. Would love to open up the floor to any questions from our audience here. Um, I don't know if we have a floating mic or not, or yeah, we do. Okay, Garrett over here's got one. Would welcome any questions from, uh, from the audience. Got one couple, uh, couple right here. Yep. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to know what was the best advice that you. Hello. Yeah. yeah we're on. Good. All right. I just wanted to know what's the best advice that you ever got from a mentor. Well, for, from John, it was B two B. Always play in the B two B space. B two C is too expensive. 
find those, be the, be the behind the scenes. UUNet, nobody knew who UUNet was. People called us WeeWeeNet for like the first 18 months or UnNet or UNet. I mean, it didn't matter what our name was. We were the infrastructure behind the AOLs, behind the Microsoft network. So all our companies have always ever been in the B2B space and let your consumer be the brand. For us, our crowdfunding platform, the reason it gets so much traction is we license it to hospital systems. If I go to GoFundMe and see in a campaign about somebody has leukemia, you have no idea if that person has leukemia. If it's on a hospital website that they paid me to participate in, it establishes your medical need. So I think you know, you've got to find that niche, you've got to stick with it. I know B2B, our customers can do to B2C, and so for us, it was staying true to that model, something you can replicate. We can learn, and I'm in a different market now, but a lot of those skills are the same and they carry over, especially when you're looking for strategic investors like big wholesalers and groups and hospitals. I, I would say there are two primary things. One is about differentiation. And, and I, I think Amy Wilkinson says, find the gap, right? So it, it really is about that. And when you have a platform, as we do with Verifeed, that can address so many different markets, you know, it can be a really big challenge in terms of focus, in terms of which one you go for. And you, you are sort of experimenting until you find those repeatable patterns. But, but, but that differentiation piece is absolutely critical in being able to articulate it very, very crisply and clearly. Uh, the other one, in a, in a B2B, because we're also a B2B um, platform, platform is the question-based sale. When you go in and you just talk about, oh, and my algorithms do this, and my thing does this, and people just like yawn, like, why should I care? I don't care how your thing works. They want to know what it means to them, and the only way that you can understand what they actually want is to spend about 80% of the time listening and 20% of the time asking questions and trying not to actually talk and letting there be silent gaps. And I, I, our, our whole sales process turned around dramatically the moment I, in particular, started doing that. It's, it's radical in how well that works. So this is a piece of advice from none other than uh, Tommy White right here, <laughs> who, uh, when I was in his class, he kept repeating, whenever you're in a room, say the room's 20 people. There's gonna be five people that get what you're doing, they're the ones you wanna talk to, 10 that are in the middle, those are the ones you need to convince, and five that don't care about it. And you don't waste your effort on that. And hearing that, it was kind of like, yeah, OK, that's obvious. But then going out and seeing it, he's like, wow, that's really true. <laughs> and it, it makes a lot of sense focusing on the people that already get what you do and are on board or are willing to get on board. The best advice I got was from the uh, CEO of Allied Capital. I don't know if you guys remember Allied, but they invested 20 million bucks in my company and called me in for a quarterly meeting. We had our meeting with my CFO. We were, it didn't go well, to say the least, because we were four months late getting our audit done. And I was agreeing with the managing directors from Allied. So I get home and I get a call from one of my board members saying, Bill wants to see you, you know, 7 a.m. in the morning. I said, okay. And Bill looks me in the eye and said, always be selling. You know, never let your guard down, always be selling. You're the CEO, always be selling. So that's, uh, that's something that I try to convey to my team too now. But yeah. Okay, good. All right, other questions? Got a gentleman in the back there? Garrett? Yep. Hi. Um, my question is uh, two, twofold. One, why DC? Not specifically just for you. Why DC for you, but why? Why DC for anybody? Why would this be a hub for innovation and startups? And the second part is, does the federal government have any part in that, or does that not play any role? So let's see, I've lived all over the place. I'm actually Canadian. I grew up in Toronto, and then I lived in New York, and then I lived in London, and then I lived in New York again, and then here. And um, business number one had to be here geographically. It was Capital News Connection. We invented this new model for how to do personalized content um, at scale. I mean, that's, that's saying something. Nobody else can really do, do that and uh, grew that and ran it for 10 years. It had to be here and in the meantime had kids, you know, got a house, 
And um, I've often wondered, um, I, I at times felt kind of lonely here as an entrepreneur for a while in the earlier days because I felt like, oh man, I should be in New York or I should be in Silicon Valley because there's more density there. I mean, it's just more, you know, um, it's particularly the Valley, just that sense of innovative spirit. You can't walk down the street without bumping into someone who gets you. Like they actually understand you. Whereas here for a long time, I felt like a fish out of water. I think that's really changing now though. So just when I was getting ready to say, okay, that's it. I can't stay in DC anymore. Um, I, there, there's this, there's 1776. There are so many more resources. There's just a much better um, community and folks that actually have your back. So it's, it's very, very different. So um, Verifeed, frankly, could be anywhere. Uh, we, we don't have to be here, although we do have clients increasingly. They're DC-based uh, clients, not government, by the way, because they're later, further down the track, too long a sales cycle. So, I think I think DC is a great area for innovation. I think you know I live in Maryland. I actually live in Frederick, Maryland. And most people have no idea the time I was commuting to Route 50 from Frederick, Maryland, pre-Greenway. Okay, pre-Greenway, but I did it every single day because I love my job. I loved everything we did. I never hit the snooze button because I was already awake anyway. It was just a great experience. So when I left, you know, the UUNet environment started my own company. Peter Barris said, well, Paula, you know, you were going to give you 18 million. We were in, in uh, NEA 9. And he said, and you got to move your offices to Tyson's Corner. I'm like, no. <laughs> I, I'm an entrepreneur. It's my company. It's 10 minutes from my house. At that time, we had to go where the money was. The money was the answer. Mm -hmm. You want to be a serious software company back in around circa 2000, you had to be in Northern Virginia. So you chase the money. You know, there's a great foundation up in Baltimore that if you're centered in Baltimore, has ample capital for you. You have to be in downtown Baltimore. That's a decision for you. It's a decision for not just yourself and your own personal life, but for those of the team members around you. For us, customer-wise, it doesn't matter. There are hospitals everywhere. That isn't as important as finding the really great talent pool that we've got here. We need living social and Groupon people. We, we know where to go to find the talent that we need. And kind of this Delmarva area, it's magic for it. You just have to look under all the rocks. Anybody else? Good? Okay. Um, thank you for the questions. Uh, first off, I would uh, like to thank our panelists tonight for a wonderful exchange and uh, great insight tonight. So thank you all very much for being here. Uh,